This is Ryan Pierce, host of Completely Serious. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. This is Baxter Colburn, host of the Verse of the Day podcast on Public House Media. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. Once you're done with this episode, I hope you'll come check out my show, Verse of the Day. In Verse of the Day, we talk about practical examples on how each verse in the Bible can be applied to our daily lives and draw us a little bit closer to all that God has to offer. A new show comes out every single day, so don't forget to subscribe on iTunes so you never miss an episode of Verse of the Day podcast. Thanks again for checking out the following broadcast on Public House Media. says it's live it says that it's live now my phone's already buzzing let's see here oh oh look at that i can just swipe it to the side any hoozles welcome to hashtag no filter friday on public house media um if you are a podcast listener from iHeartRadio or itunes or google play hello just so you know the show is usually done live on Fridays at 8.30 on the Public House Media Facebook page. Um, <clears throat> if you could, if you are a podcasty person, if you could go do um, a like or a comment or something on any of those podcast platforms, that would be awesome. Uh, but this evening we are coming to do a bit of a off the beaten path show because um, I'm not going to say that it was a slow news week for hashtag me too, but it kind of was because the only thing that really came out this week was um, Molly Ringwald talked about how like back when she was doing John Hughes movies back in the eighties, she didn't really realize how inappropriate it was. And it was just kind of something normal at the time. And she didn't really thoroughly get the writing. Which, I mean, that happens, like, when you're in the thick of doing a movie, you're like, what's happening? And you have a different, you know, they rewrite the scene ten times, and you just can't keep track of it. I get that. However, I think you have to, if you have to sit around and think about what happened to you, like, hey, did something maybe happen to me? Was that right? I feel like you, you lucked out. Like, if you don't have a clear and present story, I think you're doing pretty good in my opinion. Hello, people joining. Can you leave me a comment to see who you are? Because I can see that you're joining, but I, it's not like the role for who is entering and exiting or whatever is not showing me. So if you could leave me a comment, that would be great. Anyway, um, but something that has been swirling around since the dawn of the Me Too movement, you know, a few months ago now, is that people keep talking about how, like, oh, you know, so-and-so just did whatever they did, and now they regret it. Or they woke up and they said, uh, I shouldn't have done that, or I feel bad about myself, like, this person took advantage of me, in whatever, you know, way that they say that they did. However, here's the thing. And... I have had the life experience of doing a literal lap around the world and talking to all kinds of people that have survived um, sex crimes, sexual abuse, and or gender-based violence. Mm. And I think people... Let me back that up. Something that seemed really overlooked in all of these people's stories was the physical, mental, and spiritual hurt that that um, abuse put on them. Whether they were raped, molested, um, sexually assaulted, 
etc., and how they live with that throughout the rest of their lives. Um, there was one girl that I interviewed in Sweden who I love dearly, um, was gay, and she didn't get down with dudes because she's gay. And she was on an intrafural graduation cruise. <clears throat> and she was raped by this guy that was also on the cruise. I mean, brutally raped. And I'll leave out the Scandinavian culture situation that attributed to that. But um, she had to go to the hospital like 10 times for them to put her back together over the course of like, a year or so like that's how much damage this guy did and on top of it she also contracted um a vicious strain of herpes simplex one um thank god she didn't get anywhere else by some miracle and that's something that she has to live with for the rest of her life she has to deal with being infected for the rest of her life and that's not a joke <clears throat> luckily she had already graduated from school and didn't really necessarily need to deal with leaving school or <clears throat> putting school on hold or you know failing classes or you know whatever um because a lot of people do a lot of people do end up having their lives rearranged um one of my dearest friends in the world was sexually assaulted when we were in high school and then event and nobody did anything about it. Um, she told the people that should have listened to her, um, her family, the school, her teachers, etc. Nobody did anything. They did. They pretty much didn't tell her. They didn't do anything except, yeah, we don't care. Just shut up and get out of our face. Like that was literally all they had to contribute to the situation. And he eventually raped her in the high school bathroom. And that led to all kinds of trauma that still, granted, she didn't have to go to the hospital 10 times, but it is a lingering, lasting trauma. There is an article out in the world, and it's called The Cost of Rape. And it is um, from the perspective of a mom whose daughter got raped, I think, in her sophomore year of college. And she does a cost breakdown analysis of the school she missed, the therapy that she needed, the doctor's visits, the testing that she did, she needed for, you know, STDs and pregnancy and blah, 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 blah. Um, it's an incredible article and I encourage you to give it a look because it will give you a different perspective of, um, the aftermath um i think actually now that i'm thinking about it, i think that may, might be the name of the article i'll post it later in the comments but um it is the you know the math the literal math of what um what their daughter getting raped costs their family and those numbers are incredibly high they're incredibly high um it's not and it's a lasting effect it's a lasting effect that keeps going with that person for a very, very long time. The only, in my entire journey of doing that, the people that made it through to the other side of sexual abuse or gender-based violence, A, had a very, very strong relationship with God. Whatever religion they were, they had a very strong religion relationship with God. Two, they had supportive people in their lives. Most of them that made it through to the other side had supportive families, but friends work too. I mean, you, wherever you can get it from is fine. But those are the two major contributing factors of getting through to the next situation. There is another, um, there's a movie, it might still be enough, I don't know. It's a documentary about this girl, um, and it's called Brave Miss World, because it's an Israeli lady um, that was, she won... Miss Israel, or she won Miss. She won a pageant. She won a big pageant, and from what part of like her winning this big pageant was that she got um, a modeling contract in Milan. So they sent her to Milan, which is what happens when you are a model. You get sent all over the place. Name a place. I've been there. 
Um, and she was modeling Gotex and like really, you know, good companies. And she had a, um, she had an Israeli, she had a Hebrew speaking agent. Um, and she was really homesick. Like she hadn't really like planned on modeling with her life. Like she just did that pageant to like win things and have something to do. And modeling is really, it's a serious job. It's, it's not a joke. There's a, it's taxing. And she was in Italy, didn't speak the language, and she just wasn't, she just wasn't feeling it. So she goes to her agent and says, I need to go home to Israel. I can't anymore. I gotta go. This is not for me. So they book her a flight from Rome. So she needs to go, she needs to get on a train to Milan and go take the train to Rome to then get on the flight to go back to Tel Aviv. Um, and the guy that was assigned this, Hebrew speaking fellow that was assigned to this, put her in the car to take her to the train station and takes her out in the middle of nowhere, ties her up, rapes her, and is going to kill her. And she somehow talks him out of killing her. And he dumps her off the train station in Milan. And she called, like, a friend of a friend or something. Um, and was like, this guy just did this to me. I'm on the train from Milan to Rome to get on a flight to go back to Tel Aviv. Hell. Um, and she had to sit in all of this mess to, like, say, Paul, what are you doing? These dogs, I tell you what. Um, had to sit and, you know, all of this DNA evidence so they could keep it. So she could get tested in Rome and then go home. Um, do, do you see this? Samantha, really? Samantha likes to pop in when we do the show here, don't you, Samantha? She's a very strange creature. She looks like a turtle sometimes. Okay, all right, get out of my face. Samantha likes mouths. That's her favorite thing. If I let her be in my mouth, she will be in my mouth. Anyway, <clears throat> but the back half of the documentary is her going around and talking to people, other people that have been brave because she had a blog, and then her mom talking about it. And um, this woman that she saw that she met with in Africa was like, my daughter was just raped. She's 16. Lothosos in South Africa, by the way, is the rape capital of the world. Sweden is the rape capital of the Western world. Um, it's like my daughter was just uh, raped in Lothosos. And, you know, as a mom, what do I do? And the mom was like, she's going to sh become this like shell of her former self, like invite her friends over, see what you can do and just like listen to her and try to figure it out because there's, there's not much to do besides work on things. However, that person wants to work on it. But you know, that was a family of people that, you know, wanted to help her and wanted to, and you know, loved their child and wanted to, to, you know, aid her in her pain. And not everybody has that. That's not, it would shock you how many people don't, um, don't care or brush it to the side or, you know, as a coping mechanism, they're like, oh no, that didn't happen. You're lying or, you know, whatever it is they come up with is not uncommon. I always thought that unconditional or conditional, unconditional love meant that, like, you know, whatever happens, happens, and you love that person. And conditional love came from this person will love you depending on your behavior and what you do. Turns out that's not what that means. Conditional love comes from the situation that arises. And I have had the great fortune of meeting people who have had the great misfortune of having people in their lives that when things got rough and, you know, it got real, real life happened, they just either told them to shut up and, or made them shut up about it or was like, oh, you're a liar. You got what you wanted. You whatever, blah, 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 whatever excuse they have. And they just check out. And those words have a lasting effect. Like, I know people who were tremendous, fantastic people who still to this day are 
affected and living their lives in accordance with a half a sentence that came out of somebody's mouth. It can alter the course of lives. Um, something I've seen a lot in the wake of this, in town, like in the wake of this whole hashtag me too thing, is that people wonder, and when I say wonder, sometimes it's like nicely wonder and they're genuinely concerned or they're just being a twat about it because they don't understand this other person's pain. But um, why is it when, you know, one person gets up and says something, then 20 other people come out of the woodwork or whatever? Here's the thing. If you've never, I've had the misfortune, or I've like, I've been lucky in my life, okay? Like, the things that have happened to me are pretty mild on the grand scheme of things. And I'm very grateful for that. However, I don't lack the ability to feel for things that stuff is actually, you know, theirs wasn't as mild. It was, you know, horrible, horrific, and, you know, on down the line. But if you catch yourself or someone else starting down that road of like, oh, well, why is it all of a sudden now? And like, you're just, you know, trying to get attention or whatever, whatever, whatever. If you personally or your child has never experienced it, I would encourage you to either zip it or tell the person that you hear this to zip it and reflect on whatever that person that they're talking about, whatever they're saying, reflect on like, okay, fly for just for the argument's sake, fly under the, the flag of, okay, that was true and that happened and think about it happening. If you're watching someone else or something else um, in pain or being wronged, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you understand the extrapolation here. Um, when you can't do anything about it and you have to uh, not endure it with them, but you have to witness it, you can't get away from it, people will start making up things about that person or that thing, whatever, as to why they deserve it. And things get twisted um, as a coping mechanism for, for them to excuse themselves from not doing anything about it. And really, I mean, none of us can control anybody else, honestly. Like, we're only in charge of ourselves if we're lucky. And that's about it. Like, you can't make somebody else do something. Like, I can't, like, really? Remote? If this remote is sitting here. I can't make someone pick it up and change the channel for me. I can put a gun to their head. I can beat them to a suck full of broken glass. But I can't actually make them do it. I can coerce them into doing it, but I can't make them do it. Um, and nobody has that kind of power over anybody. However... Um, we take on a responsibility, um, even at a subconscious level, even the most unempathetic person ever, maybe unless you're like a, like a, a true psychopath, um, or a true sociopath. When we see things that we can't control and we don't like it, it's disturbing, etc. that coping mechanism comes in and that's what you see on a smaller scale or the scalable scale um, with people that are, you know, survivors of sex crimes or violence or what have you. So <clears throat> if you see that happen, know that's what it is. And it is just a coping mechanism like any other. Um, if you choke on something, your body makes you cough to get it out of your airway. It's just, you know a response that your body has to um, removing that, that foreign object or, you know, whatever. So think of it more from a scientific perspective than, or a physiological perspective than um, like, you're an asshole because that doesn't, that doesn't help anything, nor does it change anything. And when we're already so short on things that we're able, that are able to change, um, 
why is it that whenever I'm doing this show, people are just blowing my phone up? Like, why? Like, what is, like, seriously, like, what's the point? I need to start, um, I need to start doing the show for my laptop, but it's just so inconvenient. I hate it. Anyway, that's besides the point. That's not your problem. <clears throat> but dealing with, uh, reactions like that from people on those kinds of situations, and it doesn't necessarily have to be of a sexual nature, like, Anything that they are seeing that they feel affected by that they can't do anything about is when those, um, that mechanism comes in and the tides start to turn. If you're coming in and joining the broadcast, can you leave me a comment as to who you are? Because it's not telling me. Anyway. Um, and what a lot of these survivors have told me is that, like, nobody wants to talk about it, it's uncomfortable, it's this, it's that, whatever, you know, sweep it under the rug. However, you can't jump any hurdles without lifting your knees. Um, so talk about it on whatever level that that person wants to talk about it on. And there'll be a lot of people that'll tell you, like, you know, I don't even know what to say, I don't know what to do, because... I don't even know what I'm feeling. I don't even understand it. In which case, you know, a professional, um, counselor, therapist, psychiatrist, etc., um, is really, really beneficial and can help everybody who is either directly involved or an innocent bystander or what have you, um, to help them overcome it and make it to the other side of the of the awfulness. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes a long time and a lot of factors and a lot of support, but it can be done. It can be done. And that's the important part. So it's always been kind of interesting to me how like sex crimes are kind of the perfect crime from a perpetrator's perspective, because you have a victim that doesn't want to talk about it. They'll go to the end of the earth to cover up this crime for you for the most part. And if they do tell people, those people don't want to talk about it either. Like, if you were like, oh my god, this person punched me in my face, and you have, you know, a bruised up face, or, or you know, you're cut, and you're bleeding, etc. People be like, oh my, you know, the first thing, of course it's terrible. You know, nobody needs to be fighting, like, that's not, it's not cool. Like, across the board, that's pretty well accepted that that's not okay. Um... But when it's in a place that clothes cover, um, it somehow gets swept under the rug and people don't talk about it or think about the physical pain of it, let alone the, the emotional lasting pain of it. Um, it's just not, there's similar, okay, there's pros and cons to everything. There's similarity and there's differences to, like, any kind of wounds. And that one is just a special kind of twisted that's hard to get over physically for some people. Um, other people, you know, some people have better recoveries than others. And mentally, it's a lasting, lasting, lasting effect. It's not a joke. It's not something that people can just get over and just forget about. Like, it, it will change you on a molecular level. Um, years ago, Dr. Drew from Loveline did this thing about um, how predators can tell if somebody, like, they can almost smell it on them. If they're, you know, proposed victim. Oh, no, I turned the TV on. Um, Their proposed victim has been um, abused in some way. They can just feel it. Like other predators leave uh, some sort of a calling card behind in some way. But anyway, I just wanted to go off the beaten path a little bit and talk about the actual hurt that comes down on people's lives when they are abused sexually in any shade or flavor it's not a joke and hope that it doesn't happen to you but if it happens to someone in your life 
um, do the best you can. And if the best you can is getting a, um, getting help for them or being there or making a sandwich, whatever it is, do it. Um, because life is short and you'll maybe regret not taking that opportunity to do so. So thanks for listening and chatting here for hashtag no filter Friday on public house media. Who knows what we're going to do next week? We'll see. We'll see what's going to go down for, um, for next week. We'll see what the news brings us for hashtag me too. And if you're a podcast person, subscribe to the public house media, um, channel on iHeartRadio or iTunes or Google play, and you can listen to the podcast and, you know, share it. See you later, kids. Have a lovely Friday. Now that I've completely talked you into heavy stuff on a Friday night.